lot of people in trying to understand why modest warming is treated as one of the gravest dangers facing mankind. I simply do not know why. I do know what I have seen as have most other people on television, you know, pictures of palm trees in Boston, Washington underwater. And, and those indeed are part of what I suppose one could call a cataclysmic scenario. But to the best of my knowledge, they have nothing to do with what any scientist has predicted, regardless of which side of the issue he is on. But even if the Earth does warm a certain amount, what effect will this have? If there ever were to be a warming of the world, there would be a warming of the oceans, and this would increase the productivity of the unicellular algae or phytoplankton that live there. This would increase their production of various substances that when they die are released to the surface waters of the ocean. One of these substances is something we call dimethyl sulfide or DMS. It makes its way into the atmosphere as a gas where it is converted into particles around which water vapor condenses to create more cloud particles. With more cloud particles, you have brighter clouds. This reflects more of the incoming solar radiation back to space, and it cools the planet. On land, very much the same thing would happen. If you have an increase in temperature on land, you have an increase in the productivity of many soil microorganisms. When this happens, they give off sulfur gases in greater quantities. One of these is also dimethyl sulfide. You even have a situation where you don't need an increase in temperature to kick this mechanism in, into operation. That is, just the increased productivity of plant life caused by enriching the air with CO2 will put ultimately more organic matter into the soil. This is the food for microbes. You give them more food, they produce more. More evolution of dimethyl sulfide, more cloud condensation particles, and you could have a situation whereby there could be a cooling of the planet due to the increase in CO2 content of the atmosphere uh, they could overpower the greenhouse effect. Trees account for about three quarters of all photosynthesis done by land plants and two thirds of all photosynthesis done globally. What effect will a doubling of CO2 have on them? Part of the answer comes from an experiment being conducted with sour orange trees and another part from bristle cone pines, the oldest living organisms in the world. We're here at 11,000 feet in the White Mountains of Eastern California to discuss the growth of bristlecone pine. It has shown some phenomenal increases in the past 100 years or so that we can't attribute to temperature or to precipitation. We think that carbon dioxide may, the increasing carbon dioxide, may have had a very important effect on this growth. Now, the bristlecone pine is very important in this respect, and especially at these elevations because it's the only natural laboratory where we've seen this effect. And so we've begun to study this all over the dry, arid mountain ranges of the western United States. And we've found that it's quite widespread. Again, only at these very high elevations where a little bit, of, a little bit more carbon dioxide is very helpful for growth. The experiment that we have been conducting here for four years deals with growing sour orange trees under normal conditions of atmospheric CO2 concentration, and then where the CO2 content of the air has been enriched to an approximate doubling, not quite a doubling of the current concentration. And we have followed these trees, as I said, for about four years now, and the enriched trees have almost tripled their biomass. That is, they have grown approximately three times faster than the trees growing in normal air. Now this response is so incredible it suggests that were the CO2 content of the atmosphere to double, the growth rates of Earth trees would triple. And the studies that we have done over the past couple of months, looking at the photosynthetic response of these trees to atmospheric CO2 enrichment, suggest that it does not stop there. In other words, if we tripled or quadrupled the CO2 content of the atmosphere, it looks like the growth response of the trees would just continue to increase linearly. One of the very important points that must be understood and is crucial to this story 
is that we see a tremendous growth spurt in the past 100 or so years that we have not seen in the past few thousand years in these trees. Now, this corresponds precisely with the tremendous increases in carbon dioxide that are even now measured from Mauna Loa and Hawaii and from ice cores and from other places. Most recently, we have put in several new chambers where we are looking at five other species of trees. We are looking at them under a range of CO2 concentrations that actually go far above what we have looked at with the large sour orange trees over the past few years. And we find that these other trees appear to respond exactly the same way as the sour orange trees to atmospheric to CO2 enrichment. And as the CO2 content continues to rise beyond what we've looked at in the past, the response seems to be linear. It continues to go up and up and up. We have gone out to a level of 1,200 parts per million of CO2, and there seems to be no drop-off in the response. It means that we may have way more than a tripling of the growth of these trees, a quadrupling, maybe five or six times more. It's absolutely incredible. If carbon dioxide levels continue to increase, and it is critical to the growth of plants as we know it is, then we might well begin to see increases in productivity, forest productivity, wood production, as we go down the mountainside as carbon dioxide levels increase. And again, we might see a more increased efficiency at use of water in those forests as well. This might have another ramification in that over large areas, we might see a surplus of water over time. As the CO2 content of the air continues to rise in the future, the planet's trees will become more and more stimulated. That is, they will grow at greater and greater rates. And as they do this, they will extract more and more CO2 from the atmosphere. As time goes on and their growth rates are doubled or tripled or even quadrupled, which is a real likelihood as far as our experiments indicate, you will have so much CO2 being removed from the atmosphere that there will come a point where the CO2 content of the atmosphere will rise no further because the trees of the planet will be yearly extracting as much CO2 from the atmosphere as mankind yearly puts into it. Since 1986, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. has sponsored research into the effects of enriched levels of CO2 on marshland plants. Co-sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy, these experiments are being conducted near the Chesapeake Bay in Edgewater, Maryland. In this field, plants are growing in open-top chambers. Some are being exposed to twice today's levels of CO2. For comparison, others are growing in chambers with current levels of CO2. Both C3 and C4 plants are being studied. C3 plants comprise about 95% of all plant species on Earth, and the enriched C3 plants react very positively. They take in more CO2 during the day and release less at night. They don't decay as quickly. They increase their growth rate dramatically, both above ground and below it. They use water more efficiently, and they use less of it. So what do these Smithsonian experiments suggest? Will the Earth's huge areas of marshland become a depository where excess CO2 can be stored? What about the possibility of food crops doubling or even tripling worldwide? What if areas of the world unable to support crops or forests can one day do so? And what if more productive plant life can ultimately stop the rise of atmospheric CO2 completely? The research continues. Every spring, vegetation awakens and takes in vast quantities of CO2 for the growing season. Then in the fall and winter, the vegetation dies and decays, and the CO2 is put back into the air. We have about a 30-year record of this cycle. Scientists that have looked in detail at this record have determined that each year, the difference between the high and low points of the seasonal oscillation, it's, it's getting greater and greater. The only explanation that anybody has ever been able to come up with that explains the magnitude of this rise has to do with the fact that the plant life of the planet must be becoming more and more robust each year in response to the gradually rising CO2 content of the atmosphere. Undoubtedly, the, there has been already a, a considerable increase in the yields that are coming from the fields uh, because of the CO2 enrichment that's in the atmosphere. In the last 30 years, we should have had a 5 to 6% yield increase 
from the CO2 increase that already has happened. We know from historical records and from personal observations that crop productivity has increased dramatically, especially since uh, World War II. Three, four, five times more cotton, corn, wheat, soybeans, rice. And uh, we think we know why this is. We have better crop varieties. The plant breeders have come up with hybrids and much more productive, better adapted strains of these crops. We've learned to do a much better job applying fertilizers, controlling diseases, controlling insects, and our cultural practices are fairly well developed in the world today. But it also makes sense that many of these crops are of the kind that respond dramatically to increasing CO2. So it makes sense that the 30% increase in CO2 that we've experienced since pre-industrial time should have increased crop growth. What does the future hold? In great measure, it holds a variety of questions. Questions about the wholesale destruction of our tropical rainforests, about becoming the most efficient energy users we can, and questions about how we intend to feed our exploding global population. In addition to these questions, however, the future also holds great promise. And contributing to this promise is the positive effect that carbon dioxide has on our world. As we have seen, Enriched levels of CO2 in the air greatly enhance growth and water use efficiency in almost all the world's vegetation. Crop plants will continue to grow more productively, contributing ever greater supplies of food. Forests will extend their ranges. Grasses will grow where none grow now and great tracts of barren land will be reclaimed. In fact, it is not inconceivable that the vitality of our entire biosphere could rise by a full order of magnitude over the next few centuries to a new greening of planet Earth. Thank you.